Q2, laying the foundation. Q2 was a very exciting quarter for us. This was the phase in the roadmap where we started to build our identity and develop our product offering. There were three major projects. The digital footprint, our owned channels, developing our brand assets, and building an MVP. Now it was essential to have all three of these projects completed in time because without them, we didn't have a product to sell or a brand to build. Our digital footprint are owned assets. Two of the three projects assigned to Q2 were essentially joined at the hip, mapping out the social producer's digital footprint or our own channels and developing the brand assets. Now this is a bit of a chicken before the egg conundrum because how do you build out assets without knowing where and what you'll need those assets for? but how do you build out a footprint without having any assets? We decided to start with the footprint. Now, what did we do? The ideal scenario for our business was to have the following digital owned channels. A website, including hosting, a Facebook page, an Instagram page, a YouTube page, a LinkedIn page, a Twitter page, a Pinterest page, claiming our Google My Business page, having a G Suite account, and a CRM database. Now these all required accounts to be created, copy to be written, images to be bought or produced, and many required email and phone verifications to activate. Other things like Yelp and the Myriad directories were on deck for year two. And what did we learn? Start with G Suite, number one. You're gonna need an email account to create everything listed above. Starting from scratch means that your business can be isolated from your personal footprint. And this will come in handy later on if or when you need to delegate the work to an employee or a third party. And it also saves you money because you can just have one user with a shared login versus activating a new account if you do want an employee to do the work. And then finally, we kept talking to people, talking to people in this phase of how they manage their own channels and asking for insights and counsel was super valuable. Curveballs, Google. Google support was complicated and ineffective. LinkedIn support was non-existent. We had issues with our company page and it was a nightmare trying to get it fixed. Developing our brand assets. Developing brand assets is much more than just the logo. It's building out the brand identity using the business plan as a foundation. But for the purposes of this segment, I'm gonna focus on the copy and visuals needed to develop our own channel assets. Things like brand value, strategic imperative, goals, etc., were all developed in the business plan and we'll refer to them in our briefing info, but we won't talk about them specifically here. What did we do? Briefs. It feels like a tedious step for your own business, but I found it to be a terrific means to focus thoughts and direction, and also to provide guardrails. We made creative briefs, marketing briefs, business briefs, UX briefs, you name it, and we put it in a document. We started with several rounds of logo refinement. Services like 99designs are great, but I'm pretty handy with Adobe, and I was able to identify key creative territories that fit the brand we're trying to build. The services of dedicated agency were enlisted later on to help bring the concepts and identity that we created to its final iteration. I surveyed friends and family to refine down to our final version. Next, we mapped out the website. I'm gonna take a little bit longer on this segment than normal because I think this stage has a lot of value for others like me looking to make the jump. And no surprise, a brief was created for this phase to articulate the thought process. Our approach to this part of the website was always to build a brochure type website and follow up later with a more robust architecture in the second year. So not much attention was paid right now to SEO or UX because at this stage, the site is really just a stopgap until a custom site can come along in the future. A great place for us to start was the sitemap. It let us know what pages needed to be built. And once the sitemap was built, the next step was wireframes. Now this step is critical because this is where we filled in all of the blanks. Every frame in the wireframe represented a container or an element that needed to be populated. Every space had to be accounted for and the page wireframes told us how many images we needed for that total page, what their size would be and what we're gonna communicate and possibly where they're gonna link to. Now here's a tip. A great way to do this is to copy a site that is similar in scope to the one that you're trying to make and use that to populate the info in your wireframe. Now by the end of the wireframe process, we were in a position to create a copy deck, articulate a visual asset list, and build a spec sheet. This was able to help us visualize functionality. Now after this, two more steps occurred, mockups and creation of the copy deck. Knowing how many images the site will need in total came in very handy because I signed up for a nice stock subscription to get the launch images. Now this is totally worth it to do versus scouring Google image search for images. They're rights managed, 
they're high res, and most importantly, it will save loads of time. We could have spent days trying to find the right size and the right look in Google. The iStock approach was completed in a few hours, and then a few months later, we canceled our membership. Now, I also opted to purchase a WordPress.org theme. There's really no point in reinventing the wheel at this stage. WordPress.org is ubiquitous, the support community is huge, and there are plenty of services out there who will unpack and upload the site to your hosting platform for a pretty small fee. Now, to complete the mock-ups, we used image editing software. Now, I love Adobe, and I think it's a great expenditure for any business. There are millions of videos. It's not that hard to learn if you're looking to build a specific product. The depth of the Adobe stack is incredible. It's not going anywhere. So get in there and get familiar with it. Now I created non-functional mockups by taking screenshots of the pages that I wanted to use that were aligned to the pages identified in the mockups. It was super easy to take these screenshots. You just grab the Chrome plugin. It'll save the whole page as an image. Then you open up that image in Photoshop and overlay the elements outlined in the wireframes. Things like nav bars, logo buttons, images, text blocks, headers, sliders, footers, etc. I personally think it's important to mock up every single page of your website because it mitigates the chances of a problem occurring later. You're gonna have to do this at some point, so better it happens during the planning stage than in situ. Then, we printed them all out, we stuck them on the walls, and we let them marinate for a week. Now during this stage, we wrote out the copy deck. Now up until now, our text blocks had placeholders with text like lorem ipsum, but we needed to put pen to paper now. Again, not the time to cut corners. Every single character on the website needed to be accounted for in this copy deck. Once all of that was done, we were ready for staging and QA. We selected a hosting partner. I preferred someone local who I've known for years and trust. With access to the site backend, we began to build out each page according to the sitemap, wireframes, and copy deck. When we were done, each page looked almost identical to their respective mockup. After about a month of part-time work, the website was done. Now, it was during this stage of development that we parallel path building out the other own channels highlighted in the first project of this quarter. This was actually the easy part because all of the copy was written and we just had to abridge it and fit the specs to each platform. What did we learn? Upfront planning and work saved dozens and dozens of hours on the back end. Having the prep work ready meant that we could fly through the development stage with little need to stop. The development of a brand asset spec sheet was a tremendous time saver. It was just a simple Excel list that had the required elements needed for each own channel and their specifications. Most platforms have common elements, a header image, a profile image, some text, and some links. Now having these requirements laid out ahead of time meant that once the master images and copy deck were finalized, it was just a matter of abridging the copy and resizing the images. Overall, creating the own channels took less than a day to complete. Finally, progress over perfection. Getting things to a state where we were comfortable presenting it to the outside world and then moving on saved time and sanity. There's always room to improve, but improving can be an abyss and a major time suck. So how did we track? About 70 to 80%. We opted not to do the Pinterest page simply because it's not a platform that I use and taking the time to learn and engage in this platform was not an efficient use of time. CRM was bumped to Q4. Building and writing email templates was also not an efficient use of time at this stage. Curveballs. Verifying my business page was excruciating. They kept treating our business like a storefront. Eventually I had to get them on a video call and the CSM literally asked me to go outside with my Mac and show them the store. Despite explaining to them that we're not a storefront and if I left my office, the Wi-Fi would cut out and end our call. Did nothing. Eventually it was resolved, but it took three weeks and half a dozen more chats and calls. Guys, Google, get it together. Laying the foundation. Getting an MVP, or minimum viable product. Now it can be argued that the social producers is more of a service than a product. However, I feel differently. Now, although this final product isn't something that can be placed on a shelf like a sculpture or a book, at the end of the day, it's something that we've created that's left our hands and will exist after we're done with it. So we've decided that we're selling a product and we're treating it accordingly. So what did we do? Well, first we established that social producers would produce four types of video products, a video resume, a business profile, FAQs, and KOLs or key opinion leaders. Now producing them wasn't a big leap because I've been making various forms of video and film content on the side for a few years now. The big problem to solve was, can it be done profitably? 
we needed to determine an ideal price point and production post-production hours. Now we spent money on software and services that gave us efficiencies like Pluralize, Animoto, Envato, and Trello. We also experimented with crew sizes, outsourcing some of the work, placing time constraints, and various locations. We had to know in real time, what was the balance of production and cost to make the projected margins? We made demo products using ourselves and friends at the talent and clients. We left the garage and took up in a work share environment to save money and to be among living people again. How did we track? This particular project had no option of being less than 100% achieved. We planned to go to market at the beginning of Q3 and any delays would have been disastrous for our timing. So what did we learn? Well, leaving the garage and engaging with the real world was a terrific source for insights and learning new things. After a month, it became clear that a work share just wasn't right for us. We could create a professional product with minimal crew and that also Animoto lacked the customization that we really needed. We shouldn't have paid for the year up front. We also found out that a good rule of thumb to help create videos that are 60 seconds max, which is the Instagram limit, was to write a script with no more than around 110 words. These guardrails would become immensely valuable when dealing with clients in the future. Curveballs. The work share we used was doing renos on the floor above us in the evening. And one night, they flooded. Pools of water came down from the ceiling and they missed my ray drive by half a foot. Plus, the workers at the construction site next door to the building were taking over the work share parking spaces. And nothing could be done about it because the builders promised to re-asphalt the parking lot and the work share owners weren't willing to rock the boat with them. The availability of parking was one of the primary selection mandatories and when it became unavailable, it made things really difficult for us. So it was clear a dedicated space was needed immediately. 